Well, let's just get into it. So I keep it covered up because I also do all the woodwork oh, and yeah. it'll get covered in dust because it's... Uh, there it is. That's cool, yeah. Yeah, it is mini, isn't it? So what's going on here is this whole table and the motor and the bit in there yeah. was an industrial sewing machine that I was given for free. Yeah. They were just going to take it to the dump. Yeah. Um, and then, well, I really I started with the wood lathe and I've had that for a few years, but it's a gateway. It makes you want a milling machine. It makes you want a metal lathe. Yeah. And then you just, but I don't have space for all these big machines. Oh. So I ended up looking at a mini thing like this. And given that this is already on a table and it's mobile, that seemed to work quite well. Yeah. Um, I set it all up. I like bolted the things down. Mm. This like cavity here is where the actual sewing machine oh, head yeah, used yeah. to sit. Yeah. Um, but it's ended up being where I can put the tools because you're always obviously dealing with round shit and it won't roll off the table that no. way. Screwdrivers and stuff, just put it in there and know it's going to stay there. So that's really good. I bolted it all up and then I was like, ah, motor's going the wrong way. <laughs> and, and this was uh, spinning up instead of down. Mm. Um, and then so I scratched my head for many days and then eventually I found the <laughs> solution was to just twist that and like it's going to definitely reduce the lifespan of the belt but it's not three phases in uh, no no just mains so um, thinking if the motor turns the wrong way you just swap two phases and reverse it yeah the same if it's DC you just reverse the polarity that's what I was expecting it to be Yeah. so I didn't really give it much thought I was like whatever happens I can just switch it but yeah. it's actually an AC one which you have to physically remove the coils and flip them over, the, the copper inside for it. So, so that was way too hard and I was like, I do not want to open that thing. No. Uh, so I ended up just twisting the belt on itself um, and it's been working quite well. And it's also got a clutch. It used to be the pedal would control the speed. Yeah. Um, but I've, I've reversed it with this spring and stuff so that it's always full speed and then this is more of a brake. Yeah. Uh, this is a bit jank, but... It works enough. It also, it doesn't like to be turned on at full speed, so, you, so it's best to like do that, press the button, and then ease it onto it. Yeah. Because uh, the starter motor is not that powerful. Is that a centrifugal clutch in there? Um, like shoes. It just moves this yeah. side to side. Oh. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's going to be like some magnetic field there, yeah. and then this moves closer, and then it starts going. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's also got power feed, like <laughs> a very crude version of power feed where you put this up against that and lock it on. And when the motor turns, yeah. it moves this lead screw, which pulls the carriage automatically. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. This is from the 1950s. It's a FlexiSpeed Mark II made in Sheffield, back when Britain used to make things. Yeah. Um, and then also the, the sewing machine happens to be, I think, 50s or 60s as well. So I've taken these two vintage bits of kit that were destined for the dump and I've put them together and it's actually working surprisingly yeah. well. Yeah. The problem though that I'm, I keep finding is that all of the threads and everything are old imperial that we don't make anymore. This is a half inch British standard fine. So it's not universal, it's not metric, no. it's not no. like, and it's really hard to find stuff like that. So what I've had to do is um, make a hole and thread it myself because uh, I could find the taps but I couldn't find any like adapters at all for, no. for chucks and, and what I really want is to put this chuck maybe you should hold this so this chuck oh yes it's got no thread um, so it needs a back plate basically and that's what I'm trying to build here so I've drilled the hole I've threaded it that goes on there and then what we need to do today is make three extremely precise holes that will correspond with those three and go on there. I'm not very good with precise. <laughs> Me neither. So, and, and it really, really needs to be perfect because any amount of run out, like obviously that's yeah. extreme, yeah. then it will not be concentric. No. And then the piece obviously that you're trying to turn is not concentric, so that's going to be a mess. I expect it to go wrong, but I thought, the taps are not that expensive, this material's not that expensive, it's worth a go. And then if we do manage to get it pretty close, then, then we might be able to do something with it. The, the other idea is that if I make, if this goes well, uh, then I can also make a larger one, not, not even a larger one, same size, but with a larger hole that would fit on the big lathe. 
yeah. so that I can use the chuck on both. Because I haven't got a three jaw for the wood lathe, so being able, if we can make face plates easily, then I'll be able to put it on both and that would be super useful. This is my practice piece and this happens to be uh, one of the ingots we made in the <laughs> furnace video. So this is like 50 Diet Coke cans has been turned into this and it's threaded. Look at that. These are the cutters. That goes in there, tighten that down, and then the whole carriage can move up and down, or in and out, or you can even rotate it and do a taper. Jimmy drill bits. I can't actually get this spike out. I'm pretty sure you're supposed to be able to put drill bits in it, yeah. but I can't get it out. <laughs> the sleeve and that spike, they're just one piece. Like obviously they're not weird, the same yeah. material, but yeah. I can't, I can't get them off. How much do you reckon that's worth? Given that it is vintage. <laughs> uh, 250 quid? Uh, it, you're, you're absolutely right, that's what it should have been worth, but I got it for 150. <laughs> so let's try and... I don't know, The I don't even know how we're going to transfer that shape to there, like maybe tracing paper or something. Like you're the engineer, you gotta... <laughs> You gotta come yeah, up with the yeah. yeah. Uh, tracing paper. If you have like a crayon, maybe like that. Paper on. Okay. What do you think the chances of us drilling a hole that is close enough? <laughs> M6 bolts. So they're, they're quite big, and it, it doesn't have to be super perfect. It's gotta be pretty close. <laughs> yeah. So I got some paper. And the only I couldn't find crayon, I could find chalk, but it was, it was also white. In fact, I've got a, a picture that was on the eBay listing of all the critical dimensions. I, I get that for yeah. you. The edge of that hole mm -hmm. to the edge of this is three mil. And it's an M6. An M6, yeah. So So nine. Nine mil. Three to the edge, and the hole is six mil wide. Yeah. So half of that is three. Yeah. Six. six. Yeah. Oh, six mil, not nine. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So that's our line there. We need something to mark, be able to mark out in a circle. Other method of doing that is putting it on the lathe, yeah. and then putting a scribe up against uh, it. As long as you've got it in the absolute right place. That is a good idea when yeah. you use that, yeah. Or even put the scribe in, in here. Or even just use one of the tools and only gently mm. touch it. That's when you don't even have to turn it on. Yeah, just just it's turn it by hand to, to score it slightly. Okay, we'll do it like that then. Where that mark is there. Can't really see a mark. Do you want the scribes to actually... Yeah, yeah. I didn't right. have scribes. <laughs> I showed you earlier. These. Oh, center punches. Oh, sorry, center punch. You're right, it even says it on it. What's a scribe then? What does that look like? looks a bit like that. This is the Swedish military knife that uh, was in the arrow making video. <laughs> okay. To be honest, we probably want to do it powered, I think, but just very gently. You can stop it immediately, but the actual motor keeps going. Mm. So that, that's one downside of this sewing machine motor is that I have to wait seven minutes for it to run down. Perfect. Mm. Positioning them. So you can put one of them anywhere on that line, doesn't matter where it goes. Yeah. And then the other two, just make sure they're absolutely, was it 55 or something, away from each other? Or, or whatever the measurement was. There we go. So after many minutes of swearing, I think we figured it out. Exactly what Adam said in the first place. And it doesn't really make sense, because that should be 
the center of one to the edge of the other hole. I guess because it's a triangle, maybe you only add it once and then the next line that you do adds the next margin and then because they, they all sort of feed into each other. So by the time you've gone around the whole triangle, all of it is accounted for. Adam's concentrating and doesn't really care. There's also a debate that we shouldn't really be using aluminium for this kind of thing at all because it's too soft. You should use cast iron usually or steel. But with the tools I have, I don't think I'd be able to do that. No? No. What's wrong? So we got, again, we got 55. Yeah. That's not 55 there. Jesus Christ. It's 55 to these two. Oh my god, the same thing again. <laughs> so, uh, as I should probably explain, we've changed tack a bit. Uh, we've given up on recording, uh, measuring and calculating. Uh, and recording the video for, for long periods of time. Uh, and instead we're just going to draw a line from where we think the centre of each fault is. <laughs> and just drill a hole there, because calculating is really not working. This is it, isn't it, Anna? This is, this is the one that's going to work, right? And then it's going to be perfect, isn't it? I wasn't looking at it head on that. <laughs> I'm going to be surprised, honestly, <laughs> if it fits. <laughs> you were right, we should have found them in there. Uh, we're deciding to go up to a 6.5 and see the 6, just because it needs a little bit extra wiggle room. I'm scared it's going to ruin the rigidity of the piece, but we'll see. Okay, this tool is for woodwork, it's for making screws flush with a piece of wood, but I use it as a deburring tool just by doing that a bit by hand. This is probably the coolest thing we've ever made on Science and Grain. In fact, because we don't make things, we, we never make anything. I've always wanted to. Uh, make dreams come true. Exactly. Well, it looks cool, honestly. If nothing else. So the visual check. It's not that bad. It's actually not that bad. Does it look bad to you? No, it doesn't. It actually looks alright. <laughs> Let's get the gauge. So this um, is not foul, it's 0.01 millimeter. Is that a hundredth of a millimeter? So it's about almost 30, because the two that it goes over and then back. I would say it's within 30 hundredths of a millimeter. I mean, from, from guesswork, guessing where the holes were gonna be. Yeah, basically. I, I'm pretty impressed. Thank you very much, Adam. You are hired by <laughs> Science of the Greg Corporation, uh, and he will be in many future videos with us, I'm sure. <laughs>